Abbey, July 1972. The elderly bedridden aunt of former First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, Mrs. Edith Bouvier Beale, my very own mother, can you imagine? And her adult daughter, Miss Edie Beale, a former debutante once known as Body Beautiful Beale. They called me Body Beautiful Beale, it's true. Are living on Long Island in a garbage ridden, filthy 28 room house with 52 cats, fleas, cobwebs, and virtually no plumbing. After vociferous complaints from neighbors, the Board of Health took legal action against the reclusive pair. Why, it's the most disgusting, atrocious thing ever to happen in America. This is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. I was knocked out by our next two guests' performances in the wonderful Great Gardens, and so we've invited them here to visit with us. To introduce them, Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Great Gardens is a big hit for Playwrights Horizons. It's a terrific new musical about the um, uh, disturbing, grotesque, or rather terrifying uh, relationship between the um, Beale's mother and Beale's uh, daughter who lived in this dilapidated house in East Hampton. I'm sure you've seen the uh, very popular documentary, and if you haven't seen the musical, I urge you to go see it because it has two terrific performances by two actors we've seen in New York uh, many years who've always given us wonderful performances. Thank we are you. happy tonight to be joined by Mary Louise Wilson of Full Gallop fame. I still remember that performance very well. <laughs> and the wonderful Christine Ebersole, who I always thought was the absolutely the best thing in that revival of 42nd Street Thank a few you. years ago. Thank you, Michael. Uh, can you, having playing these characters, you playing Big Edie, you playing Little Edie, how did their lives turn out this way? How did they wind up living together in this bizarre situation? I think it's always going to be a mystery, really, yeah. because mm -hmm. I think other people in that same situation would have been able to get out. Yeah. And I think that's just sort of the endless conundrum about Great Gardens, and I think that's what makes it endlessly fascinating, not only in the movie, but also in the play, uh, because these questions never will truly be answered. And we should say, just for those who don't know, that they were uh, living in East Hampton. They had been wealthy once upon a time, but the father who made the money had run off, and so they were living mm -hmm. in feral, po poverty, they had no, destitution. They had n no money. And no. also, no money. I think... Mm -hmm. And no, no housekeeper and no way of cleaning right. house. They couldn't right. clean house. I think right. that the, <laughs> but they couldn't leave. They couldn't leave. Well, that's no, a, and I think it's partly because the house was part, so much a part of them. That house... Well, where the were mother. they going to go? Where were they going to go? Mm -hmm. right. uh, it was that way for the mother. And yeah. I don't think it's that uncommon that there are certain children who can, they just can't leave home. They're crippled, mm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the it's first... a symbiotic relationship, you yeah. know, and... Uh, but well, all they do is argue and carpet each other. I won't we'll get out of here till she dies or I die. Who is she? I don't know when I'm going to get out of here. Well, why do you want to get out? One another place would be Because I don't worse. like it. Any place would be much yeah. worse. Not all. Not that's um, not all they do. Yeah. So no, I think also. there's this a connect. They have a, a definite mm -hmm. connection. Yeah. That they may argue carp in front of others. Mm -hmm. There's a com competition going on, but mm -hmm. I think they're very into. We're very in interdependent on each right. other. Mm -hmm. Well, the way the show is structured, the first act, mm -hmm. you you play Big Edie, Big Edie. as a young mm -hmm. woman. You play. Mary Louise's role as a, mm -hmm. as a younger woman, mm -hmm. and Sarah Gettelfinger plays Little Edie, the part that you mm -hmm. will play in the second act. Correct. And you get the sense that, you know, Big Edie, I think, has a line where she says, well, why would anyone ever want to leave yeah. mm -hmm. Grey Gardens? Mm -hmm. But all Little Edie does is she wants to leave Grey Gardens. Yeah. And, I mean, I wonder, is it, a, is it a crime of a mother against a daughter that didn't allow the daughter ever really to leave? Did the, daughter man the mother manipulate the daughter into staying? Well, that again, I think, is is a is a conundrum because mm. she uh, it, it, was it that Edie was not able to to be independent of her mother, or is that her mother forced her to be dependent? It's it's really it, I and think in a life combination it's never one yeah it's a combination yeah. it's never one thing it is and never uh, one now, thing. Now your book writer <clears throat> Doug Wright uh -huh. created a situation in Act One where. Uh, the mother, who's you, uh, d destroys the relationship of her daughter with Joe Kennedy, uh, her, her uh, engagement, in fact, the engagement that did not exist. Mm -hmm. Joe Kennedy apparently had been one of her suitors, but not a fiance. That's correct. But he sets it up that the mother tells uh, Joe Kennedy that, that your daughter's a slut, essentially, and scares him off. So that he has, he makes an active act of the mother destroying the daughter's chances to but make a see, proper marriage. But I don't personally take it on on those terms, really. Uh, it's really a, a way of 
Big Edie showing the independent spirit of Little Edie, and it becomes misconstrued into that by because the, by the, the close-minded Joe Kennedy. Exactly, because <laughs> that was those those were the social mores of the oh, of the yeah. day. You could not be. Uh, well, see, I think even in, in a deeper level than that, you could not be an artist and nope. be in that level of society. Right. And right. that's really what they wanted to be. That's really what they wanted to be. So yeah. they were really the birds in the in the gilded cage. Yeah, the yeah, mother was ostracized yeah. as a younger mm -hmm. woman because she wanted to be a singer. That's and right. she would uh, sing, and the family just thought it was, uh, you weren't, it was like you being a it. prostitute to be yeah. in, in the in show, in business. show business. That's yeah. right. Some things haven't changed. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know. but, and that's why I think East, I think that's why Grey Gardens was so important to her, because that was yeah. the sanctuary. That was the place where she was free to be who she was. I said something uh, before we began taping I'd like you to um, expand on, if you would. Yeah. That. It's every woman's fear to become <laughs> Big Edie and Little Edie. What do you mean by well, that? Well, I, I don't mean to, uh, <laughs> to say, speak for every woman. <laughs> uh, the idea in New, in New York, if you're a woman in New York and you're single, you know, mm -hmm. and you don't have a family, you think, oh, I could, you know, the fear there that you could become a homeless or a bag lady, you know, mm -hmm. it's there if you're, if you're supporting yourself. I certainly had that. But um, I don't think I ever thought, but I know people who, you know, you can't get in their house because of the magazines piled mm -hmm. up on the floor. I know a lot of pack rats in this city, and I don't know a lot, but I know there are. Mm -hmm. I, I feel Oprah like calls it compulsive hoarding. Yes, yeah. and look at all these people are in business with uh, going to fix your clutter. These women had come from several generations of money yeah. where there were always servants. They yeah. had absolutely no strategy to even know how Take to change the bed. Right, exactly. And so then mm -hmm. we see that, another... that, this, that they're just can't even yeah. wash mm -hmm. their clothes. Right, yeah. And y you, how did you study this role? Both of you, how did you study this role? Did you, did you look at the film a lot? I think this is the best costume for the day. Oh, amazing. She's channel. <laughs> Yeah, it feels like. What was Well, I, it, independently of, of Doug and Scott and Michael creating this musical, I was out in Los Angeles, and a friend of mine who I was staying with uh, said, "You got to see Grey Garden." So I rented it, and uh, I never stopped watching it. I became absolutely obsessed with it, and I really don't know why. I think partly because, being an actor, you know, we observe behavior, mm. and it's endlessly compelling mm. of, of just about how they got this way especially when you look at those photographs of this uh, American royalty you mm. know they absolutely look like princesses so and beautiful. queens and and then to end up with like the trash all around it was yeah. just you, the cat relieving itself behind the, what looked like a singer sergeant painting you know <laughs> of the mother it just is it's mind-blowing it's just yeah. mind-blowing so I never stopped watching it and then a year and a half later they called and asked me to come and do it, and I already was so informed by it, so it was just a, like this odd sort of uh -huh. cosmic thing. Did you see the movie when it first came out? Yes, it, I did. It made, yeah. it made it a big impression on you as well? Yeah, but but uh, when they was, would call me, I, I thought, oh, I, I can't do this. I, Why not? I don't know. I, I, I didn't see myself as an old lady in a bed with a long white hair. <laughs> 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 uh, you know how we, we're in denial all the time. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I, I just thought, well, well, I don't know. I, I, you know, and I was like that all along. Well, a song about corn? I don't know. You know. <laughs> uh, but uh, I got with it. Yeah. I got with the program. I Do you have any least. sense why um, this, the mm. movie, and indeed this musical, I think, to a large extent, and these two women have such appeal for um, uh, gay men? I mean, this, <laughs> no this, idea. This documentary is a sort of a, it's become a, an important part of the gay yeah. culture. Because I think it's about the disenfranchised. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. Yeah. And uh, and I really think that that's why it even, even has a broader appeal than just the gay population because I think Americans feel disenfranchised, yeah. Uh, yeah. and particularly now, and mm -hmm. no voice. I mean, I can't tell you the uh, response I get, <clears throat> you know, when the full-length velvet glove hides the fist. Oh, I yeah. mean, that gets, I mean, <laughs> yeah. people feel yeah. really empowered by watching this freak up on stage, you know, Hoping, um, having talking lost it about all. Yeah. the mean, nasty Republican town and, <laughs> you know, all this stuff they can get you in East Hampton for wearing red shoes on a Thursday. I mean, the metaphor of that, yeah. of just, I, I think, I think it really, yeah. I think it really does speak to a lot of people. It seems to me that a real particular challenge, though, is that if you just have the audience walk away thinking of these women as freaks, no, they don't. But they then, don't. But, they don't they but that's don't. it. But they don't. Because they the don't. audience is touched by their play. Yeah. And the audience 
You say there, but is, proportion go is, I. Is mm -hmm. connected to them in some way, yeah. and you can't just sort of say, well, this is just an oddball situation. Right. No. You know? I, yeah, no. I think that's one of the... It's a heightened version of a very common situation mm -hmm. that that many of us know about someone like that mm -hmm. or have somebody in our lives. But I think there, there are these universal mm -hmm. themes yeah. Yeah, that, are, are. that are just that are so beautifully Loneliness. dramatized yeah. into, into this into this musical. And 52 mm -hmm. cats and fleas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this interdependence of mother and daughter, yeah. which yeah. is a very complex. Yeah, a lot, of, uh -huh. uh, a lot of female friends of mine are, I have this friend the other night who was, couldn't stop crying, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, they come backstage and they can't, they're crying, they have tears in their yeah. eyes, or they're crying, or they can't stop crying. Yeah. I'm wiping tears away from their eyes. It's Sounds interesting, it's become a repeat business show, you know, like Fan of the Opera and Cats. People are yeah. coming back I to see I have people that have seen Ray it Gardens. like 10 times. Really? really? They can yeah. get a ticket. Yeah. Because yeah. we have to say this show's closing uh, April 30th. Mm -hmm. April 30th. And you and try to get in, but, you know, well, right they, right. we just, just extended, extended that just last extended week. The last yeah. week. And we're yeah. also going to make a recording. I don't know if we're going to Any chance of a move to a larger Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's I'd the say the airplane's in the air with the cargo. It hasn't landed very yet. Good. Oh, very good. Actually, oh, yeah. well, you'll be sure to let us know when Grey Gardens sure moves so that a wider yeah. audience can see this yeah. fascinating, disturbing, but um, very touching, I think, ultimately, musical. Mm -hmm. Mary Louise Wilson, Christine Ebersol, thanks for being our guest tonight Thank on you. Theater Talk. Thank you. Enough with all your celebrated loves. You had two hands, you could have modeled gloves. Is it my fault that your cake fell flat? That you're unmarried, bold and fat? As the world rolls by and it is sad? I ate the cake I had and loved it. I ate the cake I had. No thanks to daddy. I ate the cake. Sometimes I think I have the saddest lie. There is a huge and colossal, colossal <laughs> musical version of The Lord of the Rings that opened in Toronto. Is it heading to Broadway? We're going to find out tonight. For once, I've heard something fresh and original from Susan. She has coined a new phrase that I think is apt for The Lord of the Rings, colossal. This is a four, I think maybe five hour uh, spectacular up in Toronto. Uh, I think it has a budget of about $25 million. And we have brought with us tonight two people who went up to Toronto to see the show and reviewed it for their respective newspapers. We're delighted tonight to be joined by David Rooney of Variety Hi. and Michael Kushwara of the Associated Press. Hello. All right, um, David, how did they take three big books, three long movies, and condense it into a colossal? And <laughs> have they been successful? Well, how they did is uh, very laboriously. <laughs> and have they been successful, I would say, they're sort of halfway there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think it's an admirable enterprise to take this huge, beloved story and try to condense it down into easily digestible terms in a three-hour musical, three-and-a-half-hour musical. Mm -hmm. But um, it's not quite there yet. There's a sense of hurtling through all of this plot of mm -hmm. kind of, let's get through this chapter, let's get to the dragon, let's get to the, you know, the, the volcano. Um, but it all happens a little hurriedly and we don't get any character depth. So what they're doing is kind of getting through, through plot points but not really emotionally investing you in the characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that that process is still to come somewhere right. in the development phase. What does it look like physically, Michael? It's huge. They have this amazing term table. They've got all these elevators going up and down. And you can see where they spent the money. It's an amazing, amazing set. And I think that's where they concentrated all their energy on. And now that they've got the technical part of it down, which is pretty spectacular, they can, I guess, go back and now look at the characters, because that's what they really need to work on. Now, you didn't care for it very much, either. No. I think you called it a bore in your review. Yes, I believe that was the word I used. <laughs> <laughs> it's a boracle. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. It's sort of like a uh, colossal, susical type show, I guess, sort of. What, you, what is the music like? 
The music is like Enya meets Yanni meets Jim Steinman <laughs> meets sort of 70s Rick Wakeman. Yannickel. <laughs> Celtic. There's an awful lot of Celtic preciousness in there, too. Yes. It's sort of a lot of hey, nonny, nonny. Oh, um, God. <laughs> it makes my flesh crawl yeah. already. And well, I, that, that part kind of phases out. Once we get through Hobbit Tongue and the, the, the first act, it, it acquires a little more drama in the second and third acts and the music also becomes more interesting. But it's not a conventional musical in that there are not songs to express certain desires of the character. You know, the, the, the songs are sometimes, some of them are not even in English, some no, of them are in... No, in this weird, you know... Middle Earth language. Yeah, elfish language. Yeah, elfish yeah. language. <laughs> and and they, I think maybe that's one of the problems with the show. They, you know, it, they couldn't decide whether they wanted to make it a musical or not. So it's sort of halfway between. And it's it like a big pageant, isn't it, that just sort of sort unfurls? Of, sort of. It is sort of very medieval, sort of a rena renaissance fair How type story. How do you make story. the hobbits little? Um, they've hired relatively short actors. <laughs> <laughs> Would they be known as? And relatively <laughs> tall actors. There was a height requirement for the show when they had auditions. Mm. There, uh, so certain actors had to be under a certain height and others had to be over a certain height. So it's not like they get down on their knees. Plus the non-Hobbit characters Just are wearing um, yes. belt belts. Oh, oh, yes. uh, to, to me, not a fan of the uh, whole Hobbit uh, Lord of the Rings series in print. Uh, I thought the movie was so absolutely fabulous because of the nature of the filmmaking, the wonderful monsters that, that, that Peter Jackson created, and, and just the, the scope of it. So I, I wondered about a stage version, you know, that really, if for me, what succeeded in the film was, was scope and uh, cinema craft, did, but did I really want to see all that story stuff? on stage. Well, I think that's the big obstacle yeah. that the producers of this show have put before themselves. You know, how do you come in after what, for people who love that story, is the ideal version? Mm -hmm. You know, you've had mm -hmm. nine hours from Peter Jackson with all of the digital wizardry that, you know, a you studio can, add, can yeah. provide, and you can't do that on stage. I mean, to a certain extent, they're trying to push the boundaries of what sort of, what can be achieved with special effects on stage. They're going more toward a Cirque du Soleil type of aesthetic with, with a lot of the presentation of it. But it's still not there. You can't conjure the same feats of imagination that you can conjure in film. So, you know, they're starting from an extreme handicap. We got a little promo DVD, which was shot, obviously, before they put it all together. But there seems to be a big Julie Taymor influence in the creature. Yeah, sort of those kind of Julie Taymor type puppets that um, we see in The Lion King. On stilts yeah. being there are monsters. people on stilts there are also... Uh, playing trees. Mm. I think those were... Well, that's uh, Spamalot. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and I, what, what the DVD is of people in rehearsal costumes, so you don't see the full effect yeah, of yeah. the costumes mm -hmm. of, of everything that they've spent on all that. Now, if you didn't know Lord of the Rings, Mike, would you be able to follow the plot of this thing? No. It's to totally it's, incomprehensible a, to a non-ring There is an extremely good summary in the playbill that you can <laughs> read uh, <laughs> in between you have time acts, to read, and like, that will <laughs> sort of, you know, give you the plot, but I've sent people to see it. Uh, who knew nothing about The Lord of the Rings and still knew nothing when they came out you know, four <laughs> hours later. It is a difficult story to follow. What's your sense, David? Um, put on your reporter's cap for a moment. Uh, does this thing have stilts or, or legs to go beyond Toronto? I mean, would it be worth the investment uh, to take this to London as the plan is and eventually to New York? Do you think it can succeed on Broadway? I wouldn't be at all surprised if it does quite well in London. I mean, I think there's a very hungry public for anything Tolkien related there, <clears throat> probably much more than there is here. Mm. And it has a certain feel of 80s bombastic spectacle about it. There's a, there's a kind of hint of Les Miserables about the tone. Um, the call to arms kind of stuff is, is very, very um, uh, similar to, to Les Miserables. And I think that the British will go for that a little more than they will on Broadway. What do you think, Mike, for its, its Broadway prospects? Broadway, I don't think it'll come. But yeah, I, I think, think so. I think it will definitely go to London. And there's still, I think there's still uh, some question about how long it'll run in Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, the Mervishes did something very, very uh, They're the producers right, and the, owners yeah, of, of the, the show. Theater, yeah. Is that none of the subscribers, Mervish subscribers, and I think there's about 45,000 of mm -hmm. them, saw the show during previews. So they're all going now. So they've got a, a cushion to at least, I think, <laughs> run into the summer. Mm -hmm. And if they can get word of mouth, and you know the summer tourist audiences they probably can get it at least i would think through labor day and but will on. it play in vegas uh, a 90 <laughs> minute only a 90 minute version as long as we've got two uh, uh, well regarded uh, critics here let's talk about a few shows that are um, out here in new york now uh, very good reviews recently for i think a terrific play david harris stuff happens you both liked it a lot uh, it's about two years after david did it originally um, does it feel dated at all? It's about the Iraq War, or is it, does it still have currency? Oh, I think 
it, it has extreme currency, and I don't think it's even remotely dated. Mm -hmm. um, I had not seen the London production, but I'd read the play when it was staged there, and then I saw a staged reading here about a year ago yeah, with a terrific right. cast. I think Alice Howard played Bush. Um, and the play has changed quite a lot. He's really distilled it quite down. And I think that he has enhanced the delineation of the characters. You understand the characters more immediately, and then he develops them in ways that, that deepen your initial impression of them. And I think that is something that the play wasn't doing before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it has enormous re relevance now. I mean, you know, the troops are still there. There's no sign of an exit. Right. Um, now more than ever, it is yeah. relevant. Yes. I think the play, and it's a wonderful production. I mean, Daniel Sullivan has done terrific things. It's remarkably, this director who works on a million productions a year has never worked before at the public, and it really is a terrific match of the director and the material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mike, um, the Colin Powell character in this play now seems to be uh, brought more to the to the to the fore than it was in London. He's the kind of tragic figure. Yes, in he's this almost play. sort of a, a Hamlet type character. Mm -hmm. uh, what should he do? And and Peter Francis James, the actor who plays uh, Colin Powell, is is terrific in the role. And I, and I think the play does have more currency now than it did you know two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's slightly updated at the end. I think, and mm -hmm. that's where I think he can keep updating it as events change in Iraq. He can sort of put on a little coda at the end. But but Hare's an, an amazing craftsman. And he's a, he's a terrific storyteller. Mm -hmm. So and I think that comes across because this is an amazing story. Yeah. If you, especially if you lay it out very straightforwardly, dramatically, you can you can get the whole sense of what really happened. Well, we had him on this show last just last week, in fact, and he was saying that um, you know he didn't think of it as journalism or a documentary about the run of the war. He saw it as a play about mm -hmm. power in the tradition of Shakespeare plays about power. Fair fair assessment. Oh, absolutely. Of his own work? It's, mm -hmm. it's completely a drama about the misuse of power. Mm -hmm. And I think what's, what's particularly interesting about it is that from a leftist playwright, a leftist British playwright, um, you would expect absolute condemnation of America. Mm. And I think the play ultimately is quite even-handed. It gives you both points of view. I mean, clearly it has an anti-war point of view. Right. But, you know, you do get both sides of the equation. Yes, he's been very scrupulous in his documentation, yes. which is, uh, you know, what he's better than most journalists, I think. Right. Now, let me ask you guys, uh, we're right on the cusp of um, big... Spring season, you know, the, you're going to be at the theater uh, every single night. We already are. You are. <laughs> you already are. Um, anything that um, you are, you haven't seen yet, but that you're looking forward to? I mean, are there certain things that come along where, criti where critics say, geez, I really can't wait to see this because there's someone involved in it I'm excited about? Or anything like that out there, David, that you're looking at? I'm really excited to see History Boys again next week. I mean, it's a, Alan, Alan Bennett, Bennett is a terrific play. playwright, yeah. and it's it was such a wonderful production in London. and as opposed to democracy and Festin, both of which were kind of butchered by being recast with Americans. And I think that there are certain plays, certain European drama that doesn't translate so well to American actors. I think that certain things in Festin and democracy obviously are very, very foreign to American actors, and the director hasn't man managed to connect them into the material mm -hmm. in the right way. But instead of trying to do that with History Boys, this very, very English play about education and the formation of adults. and and a whole lot of things. Um, they've had the good sense to bring over the original cast, which is a flawless cast. That's wonderful. And Mike, what are you? Uh, uh, you may not agree with me, but I, I'm looking forward to actually the Drowsy Chaperone. Now, why, why well, is that? It's an original musical. Uh -huh. It's not based on an 80s movie or things we've seen before. And it, it, I think it, the idea behind it is intriguing, uh, mm -hmm. to sort of have this man on stage sort of tell the story and have the musical come to life. Um, so I'm, I think it, it could be a surprise hit, I think. Well, we've heard the buzz has been pretty good. Yeah, the buzz yes, has been, it's been good. good yeah. Yeah. And, and audiences, I, th I think, are liking it. I mean, uh, who knows what will happen. Dare I ask you what you're not looking forward to? Oh, I'm not particularly looking forward to Lestat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this would be because you've just heard through the grapevine that it's Wait, not is this very kosher good? to do this? Or? <laughs> yeah, it's fine. You know. Well, this is you. You know. As a you know. What are you not looking forward no, to? No, well, critics. It? You hear the news. You yes. hear the gossip. You know. I mean, I you mean, still go with an open mind. I mean, Lestat. It's very hard for a show, greeted the way Lestat was greeted in yeah. San Francisco, to completely turn around. I mean, right. I hear they've improved it vastly. Whether or not they've saved it is still open to debate. And, you know, good luck to them. I'm going in with an open mind. Sure. I hope it's wonderful. Right. But mm -hmm. <laughs> Anything, Mike, that you approve? Well, well, also, you know, Lestat, I guess I would echo that, too. But if we go in with low expectations, Sometimes you know, they, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, 
our opinion of the show will rise, but who knows? I think back and you can render these verdicts okay. on the shows that are coming. Um, uh, Eat our words about Lestat. Eat your words about Lestat. <laughs> <laughs> Lestat. Tony, A masterpiece, David, David Rooney. Yeah, yeah. Variety. Tony Winner. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> David Rooney, Mike Kushwara, thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you. Thank and you. now let's take a look again at Grey Gardens. You fight city.